thank you all for sticking around for this. Uh, we've got a really great panel discussion that we're now going to have uh, where we will hear from people who are actually working in journalism about uh, the challenges that we've heard about this morning uh, and the potential solutions to those challenges and the paths that they're taking to make journalism better. So we have a really great panel that I'm really excited about. And I'm going to say a few words about each of the people on the panel and then uh, I'm going to ask some questions and then I'm going to open up the discussion to everyone here to ask questions. Um, so I will start with Danielle White, uh, who is the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Community Engagement at the Salt Lake Tribune. She leads the Tribune's product, subscriber, and audience growth initiatives. Uh, Marcy Young Cancio is um, an assistant professor of journalism and digital media at Salt Lake Community College. Um, although, can I share you're coming here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to be starting here in the fall uh, along with Leandra, and I'm so excited about both of them becoming colleagues, so uh, that's great. Um, she's also the founder of Amplify Utah, uh, which seeks to bolster representative storytelling in local media and amplify voices from across the greater Salt Lake community and state. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, and Elaine Clark uh, is the news director of KUER, uh, Salt Lake City's public radio station. Um, and I got this straight from the bio from your website, so I hope that's okay. She earned a master's degree in Middle East Studies from the University of Utah, uh, which included a year of academic research and work for an education NGO in the West Bank. And from 2004 to 2019, she was a producer for KUER's flagship interview program, Radio West. Uh, okay. Did say anything about rugby? That was on the website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I edited that out. Yeah. <laughs> you can add that back in. Um, Okay, so I have a bunch of questions for the three people that are on the panel, but I figured that I would just start by asking each of you to talk a little bit about what drew you to journalism, what you see as journalism's biggest challenge, and uh, what you're doing to try to work toward overcoming that challenge. So I'll start with Danielle with you. Okay, uh, so I am a U of U alum. I was an English major and then was working toward my MFA in creative writing and poetry emphasis while working at the Daily Utah Chronicle. And um, I became the first black editor in chief of the Daily Utah Chronicle. And while I was there, I was intending to go get my PhD in poetry. Um, but some circumstances and stars aligned and I got a job offer at the Tribune and said, you know, I'm going to try this um, and see how it goes. You know, five years later, after being a reporter and editor, um, I transitioned away from journalism. We were owned by a hedge fund and um, things were not great um, <laughs> in the industry during that time. So um, I, I, I pivoted toward corporate and have been in like content marketing, PR, social media, email marketing roles, um, and then transitioned back to the Tribune two years ago when we became a nonprofit um, and felt like I could really kind of marry my two loves of journalism and, you know, more of the social corporate um, aspect, more business focused aspect and, and lend my talents there. Um, I think the biggest challenge facing journalism right now is I think we need to change fundamentally how we do things at a workflow level, editorial workflow level. And that's really, really hard to get people to break habits that they've had for years, in some cases, decades, um, in order to really highlight the voices that need to be elevated, tell stories in a way that resonate with people um, and support accountability. So I'm Marcy. Um, I came to journalism I don't even know how because I've always wanted to be a journalist. Um, like when I realized that I was not going to become an astronaut after going to space camp. The journalism was it for me. And like I was writing, I was like making newspapers in my childhood bedroom and making my family members buy them. So I don't even remember where it started. Um, but because of that, and I've been in journalism from being on the Tiger Tribune in junior high, through high school, through college, and doing it professionally, obviously, that I've seen so many changes with it. My expectations of what journalism was going to be when I got into it as um, a staff writer at the Utah Statesman, where I went to, I went to school at Utah State, to how I've seen it change over time, has really shifted what I expected from journalism. And now, as a, per, a, a journalism professor, I am always looking for the ways that we can do journalism better. I've gone from 
taking a buyout at a newspaper when they closed bureaus at the Charlotte Observer to coming into the digital space and have grown alongside all of the many changes we've seen in journalism. And with that have also seen what we need to be doing better in journalism, particularly as we have more conversations about how our culture and society is shifting and how we need to do it more ethically and responsibly. And so I think the biggest challenge facing journalism is how do we respond to that call to action? How do we still keep journalism relevant and valuable and this key part of our democratic society and doing it ethically while also responding to what's happening in the world around us. Um, and so I do that largely through my role as a teacher and then through bringing this project with Amplify Utah into the classroom to offer students opportunities to do that work a little bit better, to think about that work in a more ethically responsible way while still applying all of the tenets and the standards of journalism to that work. Um, and I, there's several students in the classroom now who hopefully will be able to speak to some of that. But I think it's just engaging students and emerging journalists to be part of those solutions as well rather than just me or any of us as instructors telling you how to do it having you be an active part of that voice that's helping us shape the future of journalism did i answer all of them and then some okay so my name is elaine um i thought he'd wrap me out i was a fullback for a women's rugby team that's on the website so that's what i thought he might be going for but that is not relevant to my work. Um, I actually, not unlike you, was on an academic track. My bachelor's degree was in folklore and Germanic studies. Um, and my, as you mentioned, my master's degree was in Middle East studies from here at the University of Utah, uh, which included a year abroad. And I also intended to go get a PhD, and I was going to be a folklore professor and work for the academy, um, and became disenchanted with any number of things about the academy, uh, including how information gets to the broader public, right? So I was living and working in the West Bank, and I was encountering all these really important stories uh, about... Uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict and where that's going. And I was writing, I wrote a fabulous master's thesis, as far as you know, um, that is collecting dust in the Marriott Library right now that I think three people, no, my uncle read it. Four people have read. <laughs> so that was very generous of him one Thanksgiving. Um, and so I did. I became disenchanted and wanted to... Uh, apply my research skills and the curiosity that I have about the world and from folklore uh, from the people's perspective too like what are the stories of the that uh, the stories of the people affected by the news and politics etc um, which drew me to journalism um, and therein I think is the problem with journalism that we're encountering today is that we're we're asking ourselves really important questions about how the community helps inform the kind of stories we tell. I mean, I could talk about being in the ivory tower of the academy and the whole question of town and gown and how do we talk. But I think journalism has, has had its own ivory tower too, right? Like, we are the trained journalists and we will tell the stories that you need to know, all the news you need to hear. We don't care if you think you do or not. Um, and I think there that that problem is also identifying its own solution, which is that we need to be reporting not about a community, but we need to be reporting with the community. We need to be talking to the community, not to say, what is the story that we have to tell that matches your agenda, et cetera, but what are the questions that you have about your community? How can we serve you by answering the problems that you're seeing by fight by doing solutions journalism by answering important questions and let you see yourself in the stories that we are telling because it's you know we've got the the PIOs that we talk to we've got the lawmakers that we talk to but where where is the public in the stories that we're telling so the problem that I think we're facing also 
comes with its own solution built in, which is an exciting time to be engaged with a public who I think is hungry for good storytelling. How have your thoughts about the public and what they expect from and what they want from journalism changed throughout your careers? And uh, how have those changes in your perceptions of the public affected the way that you approach your work? And Danielle, I know from our conversations that part of that for you is um, taking issue with the idea of the public as a way of referring to readers or audiences in general. So um, part of your answer, can, uh, if it's okay with you, would be letting me know what your thoughts are on that as well. Uh, I hate the word the public. Like I hate that as a phrase. I think uh, to Elaine's point, it further draws distinction and separation uh, from the journalist uh, to the community. And I think that is part of, if not the core of, of our problem, right? And so, um, you know, we talked about other words that could be used. Uh, audience is one that's used quite a bit. It's not perfect because I think it um, implies a level of captivity that isn't true or earned. Um, you know, at one point in time, the public felt it was a responsibility to inform themselves. Um, and, you know, newspapers would put things out and we would assume that people read them and that would just be the end of the exchange, right? Um, but I think audience also is singular and what we need to get better at is understanding that there are multiple audiences and some of them overlap, but understanding before you even write a story, before you even start going out and reporting the story, um, who who you're speaking to and with and for is really important. So I think that's really evolved. Um, I think, you know, it used to be sort of right for the common denominator. And I think we've seen that doesn't really resonate anymore because for one that is constantly shifting um but two i think people really want that level of personalization to be able to see themselves in stories um to be able to understand what can i do with this information so um that i would say that that's the real crux of how it's evolved in in my 15 plus years in journalism yeah building off of that um i mean Broadcast, uh, mass media, newspapers, radio, television news, traditionally and historically in a pre-digital world was one place to many, right? Broadly casting it. There was not a, a opportunity for audiences or the public in this time to be able to engage with the content other than just being passive consumers of that information. And so while we talk a lot about how the digital world has changed advertising, its impact is so much more in terms of the engagement and the stories that we're allowed to hear back to help discern the role of those many stories, those many audiences that are out there. And it allows us as journalists to be able to be more representative. Um, and we need to be careful when we use that word too, but it does allow us to tap into more stories and more ideas in a way that we weren't able to access as easily before. And I think that's one of the biggest changes, but with that shift comes a lot of responsibility. I quote Stan Lee in my class all the time, people know this, with great power comes great responsibility, right? And so this opening of the digital spaces comes with a lot more responsibility because of the access we have into the very personal details of people's lives when they engage back with us. And now I think ethically figuring out how to do that and help those voices share their stories. We're no longer, I mean, you've probably all heard the phrase that journalists give voices to the voiceless. It's an absolute nonsense phrase because everybody has a voice. We just might have platforms in which we can help amplify those voices. And for me, that's the biggest shift in how can we channel some of that work and do it in a way where we can all learn from each other and create a more media literate society that has understanding and discourse in a really like organic and again, another word I hate authentic, but in a more authentic way for lack of a better word in this conversation. We're still working on it. We're trying to get better every time. I don't want to imply at all that these grandiose words are magically are magically making it all happen. I think it's it's an evolving thing, but I will give you an example. Um, I 
along with our afternoon host and one of our, our one, our one uh, production manager. <laughs> We're going to St. George next week to uh, broadcast from there. Um, I'm hiring, a, I have just hired a reporter to be in St. George to replace a former reporter that we had there. Um, in my perfect world, this was going to be like, and here's our new reporter for you all to meet. Of course, he's not starting until May 1st. So there you go. That's how life goes. The more you plan, right? It goes all awry. Um, and it's really important for us to have someone on the ground there, right? Not to j just be up in Salt Lake City reporting about a place that's four hours away and so I had this moment where we're like okay that's okay he's not on yet but we're gonna have we're gonna do some two-way interviews and we'll, we'll be there it's gonna be great um which is you know I'm sure you've heard the term parachute journalism <laughs> hello we're driving down four hours to talk about you um and so I wrote a survey. I mean, I've got a database. I've had great reporters down in St. George. I've got this list of sources. And so I sent a survey and it wasn't what stories should we tell? Because I think when you say that, people think, oh, this is my agenda. This is what the story that you need, right? They don't think of stories in the same way they do that we do because they have the business that they're trying to accomplish, which is get the word out about an effort that they've got or something that they're passionate about. And we have the approach that we need to take, which is uh, balanced journalism that takes on questions and uh, reveals something about a community. So I spent a lot of time thinking about how to write this survey. And I asked questions like, what do you think the rest of Utah misunderstands about St. George? What are the questions that you would like to have answered about your community? What is the biggest challenge facing your community? And I spent a lot of time thinking about the questions so that I could solicit what we needed as building blocks to be able to tell stories. Um, and we won't be able to tell many of them. But I also have this fabulous present to give to our new reporter to say, and here are some really thoughtful responses. Um, so as you know, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to find good stories. And talking to people like this as you're doing source development is what that is. That's what source development is all about. Um, and so I'm hoping that that's just the very beginning of a great conversation that is ongoing with St. George, Washington County, and uh, beyond in Southern Utah. In the context of the presentations that we heard earlier today, which uh, for those of you that weren't here, were uh, had a lot to do with uh, journalists' sense that they really needed to maintain their neutrality in their reporting and the way in which that sense that you need to really stick to neutrality could sometimes um, come at the expense of, can sometimes be weaponized against journalists or come at the expense of uh, arguably the accuracy of the reporting um, or be in contradiction with uh, the goals that you're sort of espousing of, of, of working with communities. And so um, the question I have for you is, um, how do each of you think about the importance of neutrality or objectivity um, specifically in relation to these other goals that you're describing about um, really working with and getting to know the communities that you seek to cover? I mean, I think that this is part of our shifting conversation on journalism generally. I do think that there is a place for neutrality and objectivity in many stories still, um, but it's more complicated now, of course, as well, um, where I think that incorporating your lived experience is a really important part of a story. This goes back a little bit to parachute journalism that Elaine talked about. We can't, as reporters, we cannot understand nuance, we can't understand detail, color, any of the things that makes a story impactful if we have not spent a significant amount of time with a community or with a story, period, hard stop. 
it will be superficial and all we're doing is communicating superficial messaging by continuing to do that. So when there's the opportunity to work closely with people who know the story or to draw on our own lived experiences to help tell a story, we should do that. It should not be seen as a detriment in journalism to help tell more compelling, more interesting and more engaging stories. But to still do that through a lens of journalism, of journalistic standards, I think is really important. So knowing if you're close to a story, where your biases lay and to be aware of them. And if you are too close to a story to be able to see the other side and try to understand another side, then maybe you need to pass that along to someone else. And that's okay too. Um, but to draw on some lived experiences can help us tell more compelling stories. Some of the work that my students have done, for example, um, we have a student who uh, was born in the United States to Mexican parents and very much felt like she was living between two cultures. This idea of dual cultural um, living where you don't really feel fully Mexican and you don't really feel fully American. And what does that kind of third culture mean to you and how does that affect the way you live your life and a lot of people experience this so she was able to tap into that lived experience it was not a first person piece but she interviewed lots of other people who had a similar experience and was able to write a story about that in a way that was meaningful and that she could do with authority without it being a first person opinion piece and be able to share a story that had impact by leaning onto those lived experiences where can we find those opportunities and and explore that. You don't want neutrality in a story like that because you won't learn if you have neutrality. Um, if you're covering a new bill, a proposal of a bill, being neutral is a good place for something like that, right? But we don't want neutrality when we're talking about violence against women. We don't want it to be like, oh, I'm good. one way or the other, you know, like, eh. One side's the same. We don't want it there. So it's knowing the stories and figuring out where neutrality matters and is important, but not applying that as a blanket approach. We can't do that anymore. Our society has shown us we can't do that responsibly anymore. I think, speaking of words we may or may not like, <laughs> I think rather than neutrality, I think a lot about fairness and being fair to all of the sources in the story. And I think it's not about not having a perspective and not being without any opinion because we are humans and we learn a lot as journalists and your reporting will lead you to learn facts and to form viewpoints on a story. I think it all starts though with the question of the intent that you have going into the story and that is do you have an agenda in telling this story or are you asking questions and will you let your reporting take you where the reporting takes you? So if at the beginning you have an opinion on the bill and an agenda on the bill and you say, I'm going to talk to these people and not talk to these people because this is what I believe and this is where this is taking me. That's not good journalism. If you start out, maybe you have an opinion, but you're like, I want to learn about this bill. I want to talk to all of the stakeholders. I want to understand the different perspectives. That may still lead to a viewpoint on the story, but it's not driven by your agenda. It's driven by the facts on the ground. So I think fairness and intent are the watchwords. And I think neutrality can have several definition, definitions within this framework too, right? So trying to present a story based on all of the nuanced reporting that you've done to try to provide a stance of information without it being this is my view, my viewpoint on a piece, right? And that's, I think, like, like all of our language, even that definition of neutrality, I think has shifted a little bit when we talk about it in, in this context. Yeah, you covered, both of you covered most of what I would have said, but um, the only thing that I would add is, um, I think back to your earlier point about the journalism ivory tower, I think neutrality is probably like, a support beam in that that ivory tower in that um, 
we feel that neutrality is a mark of purity and that oftentimes strips away the humanity of a story. Um, and we feel like if it's, you know, as straightforward as possible, we've done our jobs, uh, you know, being neutral. And that, I think that's dangerous and irresponsible, um, frankly. And so if you mean by neutrality, something like fairness, you know, knowing the stories that apply to it, great and fine. Certainly don't get bought off by, you know, a billionaire uh, <laughs> to tell a story he wants you to tell a certain way, obviously, right? Um, but I don't think neutrality is something to hang your hat on um, or be proud of um, in, in a lot of instances. And I think that a lot of journalists prioritize that over the storytelling, over the fact finding, over a lot of things. So that's, that's the only thing that I would add that they didn't already hit. A lot of the conversations about objectivity and neutrality and specifically the critiques of those things, as I'm sure you all know, uh, stem in large part from critiques of who is actually deciding what is objective within newsroom management. Um, you know, uh, how many of the people within newsroom management are white and male um, and what that does to decision making uh, throughout the rest of the newsroom. And I'd like to know um, how the newsroom management within each of your newsrooms uh, in your experiences are discussing questions of representation um, in relationship with things like objectivity and neutrality and, and the values that underlie a lot of traditional reporting. So from a representation standpoint, the Tribune, um, over the past couple of years since undergoing new management, so to speak, um, has really focused on trying to match the newsroom demographics to the demographics of our state. Um, we made a lot of great progress on that. We're not there yet. So it's an evolutionary thing. Um, we have partnered with um, the Diversity Pledge Institute, which works to vet and place um, diverse job candidates with journalism backgrounds in newsrooms. And it's sort of like a two-way relationship. So they're coaching uh, the candidates, but they're also coaching the newsrooms on how to, because hiring isn't just enough, right? Um, and uh, we also did our first source audit in the fall, um, looking at the demographics of the people we are uh, quoting in, in our stories, but also what role they were playing. So not just to say, you know, we quoted a Latina, but was she affected by what we're talking about in the story? Was she an expert? Uh, was she something else? Was, she, you know, a, a community leader? So kind of taking stock of the different roles people play in addition to, um, you know, who they are, or how they identify have been some actionable pieces. But I will say that, you know, in the wake of George Floyd, there have been a lot of activities in a lot of workplaces, newsrooms included. Um, but I think where we're missing the mark is that we're not focusing on outcomes, holding ourselves accountable to those outcomes. Um, and I think, you know, it starts with editorial workflow, but also some of, you know, the other practices. How are we uh, hearing and listening to our employees, our employees of color, our LGBTQ plus employees, um, and, and really fostering that culture and, and with measurable outcomes. And so um, I, I do worry a little bit that we're kind of in this sort of activity trap of like, we're doing things, we're doing things, we're doing things, but is it? you know, take stock, is it moving the needle? Are we actually affecting change? Um, and I think we need to hold ourselves a little bit more accountable as, as a whole. The frightening thing for some newsroom management is that there's, it, all of this takes, it's some risk taking and some stepping outside of comfort zones. Like, I I go through various times where I have a job opening and maybe I have a broad pool of applicants and maybe I've got a really young pool of applicants. Um, and sometimes it means maybe hiring somebody with a little less experience and being willing to work on the job. But that also means being willing to listen and tell stories that you may not be accustomed to listening to and giving everybody in the room a greater editorial input, right? Because someone may see a story that 
never even occurred to you. Um, this sounds super strange in a state like Utah, but this really kind of hit home for me yesterday when I saw one of my reporters saying how frightening yesterday was for them when they heard, when there were all the rumors of um, guns in schools throughout the state. And when I hired this person, um, I, and that's why I say it sounds funny, I was hiring the first person in the newsroom, not the first person ever, the only person in the newsroom who has children. Which, like I say, sounds super weird in Utah, but I have a young newsroom. And it was one of those moments where, and this person had been saying, we need to talk about this this afternoon. We need to talk about this this afternoon. I was like, yeah, nothing came of it. Thank goodness, blah, blah, blah. But then it suddenly dawned on me, this person is living that experience. And this person is representative of, you know, how many hundreds of thousands or how many thousands of people right now have been seeing this going down on Twitter. Um, and so it's also thinking about diversity broadly in terms of um, having people of color, having people from the LGBTQ community, having parents, having people from different parts of the state, um, and giving them all a seat at the editorial table too. So it's not a top down, these are the stories we're doing, but it's what are we all bringing to the table today and listening to each other and respecting each other's stories. Building off of that and then, well, building off of what both Elaine and Danielle have said and from that question. So the Tribune is doing all of these many projects. It's really great. Amplify Utah is one of the projects within the many things that the Tribune has been doing. So Amplify Utah is a project um, in which we, I, in my role as a journalism instructor, work within the classes to try to find stories of broader representation based from, I'm at the Salt Lake Community College, so based within what students are seeing and experience on campus and within their own lives. And then using that to fuel stories that can then be written and shared with um, media partners like the Tribune, hopefully we'll start working with KUER at some point, to be able to take those stories and share them more broadly with mainstream news audiences. Stories that we might not always be hearing um, from our traditional legacy media organizations. Um, and so when the Tribune engages, or the KUR, or any mainstream local legacy media engages with projects like this, you're hitting broader cross-sections of the public. You're bringing in reporting from voices that you might not normally have on your newsroom staff. So diversity isn't just in the stories that you're telling, but who's actually made up of that and how stories can be shared and communicated. And then building off of what Danielle said in saying that there's all these projects, but how much is doing, bringing the project in and how much of it is sticking? I think part of that is because it's all new. And so things have to sit for a little bit and grow to start seeing the impact. So I am incredibly hopeful and emboldened by all of the work that's being done around collaborative journalism, around solutions journalism. Um, I don't know if you, has anyone here heard of the Great Salt Lake Collaborative and the work that's being done in that space? That's a really, really great example. All three of the organizations represented up here on this panel are part of that collaborative with KUER, the Salt Lake Tribune, and Amplify Utah, plus another dozen or so news organizations from across the state. This is a really great example of how the work started off a little bit slow, but now, for the most part, if you've heard stories about the Great Salt Lake, it is most likely coming from the collaborative work here. But it was a little slow, and now we're starting to hit a little bit more of a stride. Would you agree with that? We may be spinning off onto another point because I think some of the focus of the collaborative has changed this year with more community engagement, which is also a really interesting part of the journalism process, right? Like, We've we've written stories or we broadcast stories and we've sort of lived in this if we build it, they will come world where we're like, we made this masterpiece. Surely you're inspired by it, right? Um, but that's not enough anymore because there's so much competing for people's attention. And so I think I think I see the collaborative sort of 
uh, morphing too into this community engagement phase of what's happening because we have been doing so much reporting and shared it so broadly and made it available to so many eyes and so many ears, which was the purpose. And now it's like, okay, we have this body of work. Now what happens with it? Which is interesting to watch because I, and this has been a big conversation in the collaborative, how are we balancing that line between community engagement and activism? And where does that line and what partners are responsible for what and what are the journalists' role in that? So yeah, there's a lot of interesting ways to see that continue to grow. Maybe I misunderstood the question. So it's so easy for all of these questions to spin off in so many different ways because of how interconnected work around journalism is, especially when you're doing collaborative work and you are working um, on something like the Great Salt Lake. From a diversity perspective and what that means in a newsroom, I think the collaborative has also allowed, using that as an example, has allowed for broader reporting into the Great Salt Lake. So we've a lot of the newsrooms have talked to indigenous leaders about the role of the lake within indigenous communities in Utah, which was never a perspective that I remember hearing in local media around the lake. And when you work as a collaborative, if KUER does a story with um, along those uh, along those lines, having indigenous leaders talking about that, that can be shared with all of the newsrooms. So you're talking about taking the reporting that can be done in one place and truly amplifying that work when we work collaboratively. So it's not just one newsroom doing the work to increase diversity, but in those partnerships, it can also help increase that diversity and representation across the wider local media ecosystem. You all seem like you have very clear uh, ideas of what you think journalists should be doing to make this w profession better and to make its connections with communities better. Um, how have the economic realities of journalism uh, complicated or impeded those efforts to accomplish those goals? And, and what are the paths that you've taken to to navigate those challenges? So for 150 years, the Salt Lake Tribune was a for-profit newspaper like most, um, including being owned by a hedge fund, which I already talked about, um, boo hiss, um, <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Um, and then after being purchased uh, by the Huntsman family, was transitioned into a nonprofit, right? So in my, in my time at the Tribune, um, both before uh, leaving and then coming back, I've, I've seen all the business models pretty much. And um, I'm, I'm really optimistic about um, the nonprofit journalism business model uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, you're, you're seeing different versions of it across the country. The Tribune is the first and I think still the only legacy paper to make that transition. And so one thing that's really important to me and uh, motivated me for taking this job and coming back to the Tribune was to try to create some sort of playbook um, to hand over to other legacy papers to, to make that transition. But you're seeing, you know, new uh, startups all over the place. And I, and I think that's really encouraging um, that they're being sustained. I think there's a um, philanthropic uh, movement happening right now with larger organizations like Knight Fund or American Journalism Project um, funding Google News Initiative, funding these sorts of efforts. So I'm really heartened by it. Where I think, you know, the rubber hits the road and there's some friction with that, however, is that, you know, as we're kind of learning how to do this new type of journalism, it doesn't always take off. You know, people aren't always reading the stories that you feel is the right kind of story to be publishing and, and, and is done the right way. And so sometimes that can be hard, especially in newsrooms that are focused on the number, right? And so how do you balance, uh, you know, the data and being data driven with, you know, doing the right thing. And sometimes that can be an, be at odds and it, and it just can be. And so I think every sort of, um, newsroom management is having those conversations of what is that balance for us and what can we learn from these stories that are flopping, that are important. Um, you know, we tried for a couple of years to do a, a women's beat and was a very hit and miss. And then all of a sudden, um, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that coverage started to connect. 
Um, and so sometimes it's patience. Sometimes it's understanding that this is the right thing to do. We know it's the right thing to do. These stories aren't going to, you know, all go gangbusters necessarily at the same time, but investing in doing the right thing and investing in building those relationships too. Like there are communities that the Tribune and its existence has harmed. Um, there, there are communities that we've ignored and you can't just write one or two stories about those communities and expect to be like, okay, everything's better. And now that everybody's reading, everybody on the West side is reading us now. Right. Um, so I think it, you do have to have some patience and invest in, in that relationship building at the same time. So, but again, that can cause some friction if those stories aren't doing well, because it's like, you know, management does want an ROI. So finding different platforms, different ways of telling these stories, also one way that you can go about it rather than traditional story clicks. For-profit model is heavily relies on advertising, obituaries, um, classifieds, that sort of thing. Um, it also usually is owned by a conglomerate of some sort, uh, have sister papers all around. So there's a level of independence with being a nonprofit that is um, – you know, not there for most for profits, but there's also the sense of belonging and and why I'm like so passionate about audience and and community, is because you know we are supported like literally by the people that we serve. So it's more of a symbiotic relationship than a you know previously parasitic relationship in some cases. Um, and so there's really that accountability to the community rather than accountability to a big company or a big boss um, that is just like getting all the big bonuses. The other thing is like every profit that we do make goes back into the newsroom. So we can make more hires. We can um, buy equipment to better serve people. Again, it's not going to bonuses for like big media bosses. So um I, I think that that's a good thing to, to have our livelihood and accountability come from the community and not, you know, from advertisers or from afar necessarily. Amplify Utah is part of this new revenue model is not a revenue model itself, but is it a project that supports a new revenue model? I took a buyout from the Charlotte Observer at the tender age of 28 years old. I thought I would be in newsrooms for the rest of my life. I learned pretty quickly that because of the loss of classifieds and obituaries and advertising, that that was not going to be the future for me. Went into television, working in large markets across the country, and just was kind of disenchanted by the advertising model that had to support that work. And so taking that and moving into a full-time faculty position, I started looking, and my move into a full-time faculty position coincided with when the Tribune became a nonprofit. So started thinking about how all of these groups are doing things to support where journalism is going. How can we work smarter? And rather than the Trib trying to do it all by itself and me trying to train people for a world that doesn't yet exist and is constantly shifting, how can we bring all of that work together and lean on each other to do better work? So how can the work that students are doing support the work that the Tribune and that KUER and that our other outside, that our local news organizations are doing. How can we work in collaborate, collaboration to do this piece to help support this piece? And I think looking for opportunities like that is one great way to kind of mitigate the amount of money coming into newsrooms. So and. Also, so if you, you, if you are a student journalist or an emerging journalist published through Amplify, published via Amplify Utah with any of our news media partners, then you get paid a stipend. It's not a lot. It's not going to pay your rent, but you get paid a stipend. Right now it's $100, but I don't put that publicly out there because it could shift. If you do a more complicated story, maybe it'd be a little bit more. If our budgets go down, maybe a little less. But it's important to pay you because I think the fact that we hit a stage in the digital world where we didn't put a financial value on journalism and we trained the public, we trained people to think that good information is free. And it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time, it takes money to produce good work. So I think part of that is making sure that we reserve the money that we do have to make sure that we're supporting a future of it. Um, and by working in collaboration like this, Amplify Utah does all of its own fundraising to be able to pay stipends. We don't charge our media partners for that work, but we do assure that our students get paid for their work. And so I think that 
And of course, then we're working in partnership with Community College. When I come up to the U, we'll be working in partnership with the University of Utah. And I think that as we build a new landscape, it requires a little bit of putting in from all of these groups that universities that are supporting the work need to put in a little bit, that newsrooms need to put in a little bit, that organizations like Amplify Utah need to put in a little bit. And for the Tribune, I'll use that as an example because they've been our our primary partner in this work. They dedicate resources through an editor who reads the stories and provides feedback before publishing it there. So while they're not writing an actual check, they're investing money through the time of their professionals. And I think looking at how projects like Amplify Utah, and there are many across the country, different, but many, many people are looking for better ways to do this. How can we contribute to these new revenue models in a way that is outside of the mold to maybe make it more sustainable? don't know that I have a lot to add uh, because public radio, nonprofit, since... The 60, I don't know, since since it's since its founding, um, which is interesting, right? You don't have the subscription model up front. You have the faith model <laughs> in the back, right? It's fun drive. You want to hear me give the numbers? I know them very well. Um, so... You know, we have we have a long we have a long history, and I think you articulated so well what that means, um, who that makes you responsible to um, as a funding source, and um, the conversation about partnerships is one that's so crucial right now. I saw this horrifying graph the other day that I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> was the growth of political politics podcasts and there was a blue section for left-leaning podcast and there was a red section for right-leaning podcast there was this little teeny yellow section for podcasts that are in the in the middle right that are neutral that are trying to do the responsible journalism that we're talking about and it was explosive and the red side was really big and the blue side was not as big but yeah back to the little teeny yellow side um and I was just so distraught (laughs) right because there is this there is there is this appeal to people's there's this appeal to people's emotions and not in the provocative way that we want to provoke your curiosity or we want to provoke your empathy or we want to help you understand the world in a different way but the provocation that is doesn't that make you angry or doesn't that confirm all the biases that you already had and so I sat there dejected (laughs) going with all of that growth what does that mean for that little slice of the yellow? And I kept coming back to the idea of people seeing themselves in the stories that are being told, right? And that's why I think people like the far right and the far left stories because they confirm, it feeds their confirmation bias. That's right. I aren't I smart because I agree with everything they're saying but if we're not reflecting the community <laughs> plural in the work that we do why would people trust us uh, they listen to the story and they're like you don't know my story you don't know how that bill is going to impact me when I try to go to the grocery store next week so getting out of that tower and talking to people, all of the people. (sighs) That sounds highfalutin. We're going to talk to all the people. But making a good faith effort, I think, is the only way, is the only way we can build trust, to let people know that we're listening and that their stories matter. I would just say I agree with everything Elaine said um, and that, I don't think there's one reason that people have lost trust in journalism, 
or the news. And therefore, there's not one solution uh, to redeeming that trust. Um, I do think it begins with listening uh, and not in a I'm going to ask you questions and then you answer it and then I will quote it um, sort of way. But in true actual listening, uh, it's funny, we were in St. George uh, yesterday as as well, uh, doing a listening section, a, a session around um, housing affordability in, in St. George, specifically around that issue um, and got a lot of information about it. We've been doing a few of those pop ups, but people want to be validated and want to be heard. And if they don't feel like they're being heard, why would they trust you? Um, and yes, you can only write effectively or create content effectively um, about communities if you understand those communities and, and uh, share the burden of telling the stories with them. So um, just plus one with most of what she said and just also just there's not one solution. Um, it's going to be a community by community thing it's going to be a platform by platform thing because like I would say Gen Z doesn't trust news for a very different reason from indigenous communities don't trust news right and so those are going to take very different thoughtful intentional approaches to, to solve those problems and if the problem problem and problems are ever solved there's just going to be new ones it's never going to stop <laughs> it's not like we figured it out and now we can just do it it's it, and it, so I think we have to have a thoughtful approach that we're always going to be responding and shifting and changing and we have to be flexible legacy news media has been a certain way for a very long time and we are now starting to see those shifts happen people are less likely to die on the legacy hills that they stood on for for decades and that's good. And we just have to continue to respond and react accordingly. So, and I think trust comes when you show flexibility and growth. I, I think that, that we have to get there and then we have to keep striving to do it well and executing it to be able to hang on to that trust. Last thing, the will, <laughs> some humility, um, you know, the, Corrections have been a thing, especially in newspapers, forever. But being transparent for what, when you mess up and fixing that and um, showing that you're committed, I think, also earns trust. Our Instagram audience does not let, it, let us get away with anything ever. Um, and not in, like, our Facebook or our Twitter audience sort of way, right, which is more, I would say, trolling, but in a very constructive, like, accountability space. But then when we fix it, or we say, you know, we change a headline or we do, we respond, they're the first people to say thank you for doing that, right? And so I think that also builds trust and not being afraid to admit when you're wrong, which I would say legacy papers have been traditionally. I think it actually goes very well with what you were just saying about humility, about being willing to correct errors, and about I think there's a lot about transparency of process, too, that for me is a big difference when I look at a story that makes me question it. I'm like, oh, you know, media literacy would teach you. Can you find that in other places? Are there links, right? And if I read a story and there's nothing there that indicates where did it come from? How did you get that data? How did you come to all of these conclusions? Which means it's incumbent on the trustworthy media outlets to be transparent about the work, which is why when you see one of our stories online, it is chock full of links. Maybe there's document embeds. It's like, don't believe us. Don't believe what I have to tell you. Here's, here's how we came to all of that. Do, you know, do your work too. You can trust me. But don't just take me at face value. Here, here's how we came to where we arrived. Um, and yeah, being willing to fix those errors and make that, make that very transparent um, is so crucial. And, you know, reporting on ourselves, I think, is important too. There's some really terrific uh, media journalists out there on media like on the media, on the, on the weekends, on public radio, or journalists that are uh, reporting on the business of what we do. And 
just have to be vigilant and constantly hold ourselves accountable and respond to our audience when they hold us accountable um, and really take a hard look at ourselves when somebody calls us out on something. The first reaction is often, I work so hard on this. I know what I'm talking about. Blah. Take that beat. Are they right? Yeah, turns out they are. We've got to own that. We got to respond to them in kind. Um, yeah, there's not one solution to the problem. Um, and I wish I had a better answer, but all I can do is be responsible for the work we're doing and um, owning it with the public. And that means, of course, that all of you consuming information also need to contribute to it, right? Know the differences between quality journalism and media and shoddy work, right? Pay attention to the work that is chock full of links and embeds and first and last name sources and titles and where they work. And if you see things out there that don't include that, like it, wonder why and question it. I mean, because it, it doesn't, this doesn't fall, this burden does not fall on the shoulders of any one group or any one people or any one news media organization. It is the responsibility of all of us, whether we're engaging with it or creating it or publishing it, right? So, you know, dive into it and, you know, like, well, let's go back to Stanley, put your spidey senses on. Like, if it doesn't feel right, question why. Um, you know, and I, I think that another, Elaine made me think of this. So something that, like, I was always trained in a lot of, like, old school journalists, and I think it still resonates, is the idea of if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out right? Like, don't take anything at face value. Like, maybe go ask your dad or someone else, your sibling. Does mom love me? Oh, she does? Okay. I've got verification on that. Like, apply that to everything. And that will help you think about the information in a better way. And it will help you also understand what news sources are worth going to and maybe which ones aren't. I would say prior to me coming back two years ago, metrics were you were weaponized. Um, it was sort of, if you had the lowest metrics, you were on the chopping block to be laid off first. Um, there was inconsistency around, you know, what we were measuring. There was a lack of transparency around, you know, what was winning, right? So you had 2,000 page views on this story. Is that good? Is it bad? No one knew. Um, and so when I came um, back, people were very stressed about the fact that I was more of a metric driven, data driven person. Um, and I had, it took a very long time and, you know, I feel like I've won the majority over, um, but th there are still some people who balk at it, um, but really had to change their approach of, of how we are transparent with metrics, what the goals are, um, talking about that. We have, um, I hired an analytics director who meets with each team monthly to talk about what stories did well, what stories maybe didn't, why, um, what we can learn from it, right? So using data to really inform, not penalize, I think has been a, a big piece of that, right? And in and, and changing our culture. And now people like want to know they're hungry for it. Um, we still have a ways to go to be what I would consider like data literate, but we've made a lot of progress in the past year and a half to two years. So um, heartened about that. Um, as far as the community news, like all a BBC, I know way too much about the BBC um, due to a, a program that I'm in through Pointer. Um, but I think you wouldn't see that queen example in community news, right? Um, because BBC is trying to take a very global s standpoint, right? And and un operating under the assumption that most people don't know about everything with the Queen, right? Um, where I think community news has limitations, though, or risks, I think it's limited in reach, right? Um, so not everyone is going to care about what the Salt Lake City Council does or doesn't do, right? But where we have found success or opportunities for success is... Um, you know, the LDS Church, for example, there are a lot of members, former members or people who were curious about the LDS Church. We get a lot of traffic um, about that. Same thing with like Lake Powell, Great Salt Lake, environmental sort of things. We get a lot of traffic from California, Arizona, Colorado, people who are interested in that sort of thing. So looking for the ways that your 
community news might be applicable elsewhere. One of the best stories I think that came out of the Great Salt Lake Collaborative was going to a similar lake in California that had been saved and said, like, what what did you guys do? How might we translate that? Or what could we translate that um, into at the Great Salt Lake, right? And looking for opportunities to do that nationally, internationally, statewide, right? I, I think that's that's where you want to push. But there are the limitations of, you know, not everybody's going to care about your community. So that's, I hope I answered both of your questions there. So prior to coming to, um, to teaching full time, I was the first digital EP at a um, television station in Salt Lake. And then I was managing editor of a station, a digital managing editor of um, a station in San Francisco. And so I learned a lot about the metrics, and it was at a time where we first came in, I was the first ever EP of digital at the station here in Utah, and it was a lot of, okay, we need to have those numbers up, we have to drive traffic. We were really trying to keep up with another station that had a really strong Facebook presence. And so we were doing all the stuff that was sensational. And it wasn't great, right? Like some really, like obviously we were doing good stuff too, but like, you know, like, Kim Kardashian stuff did really well. And all the comments would say, why is this news? And the response is because you clicked on it, right? Like it's driving traffic, that's why. You're telling us you want this. Um, and, and we just started to learn that, that we are training people to have an expectation of the information we're going to give them. Um, and we published one story, and looking at the metrics, we published one story that came, I worked for a station that has a vast national network, hundreds of stations across the country. Um, and so we could pull from stories from all of these other stations. And we, um, I was not, it was early in the morning, I was not yet at work, but our digital producer published a story that she knew was going to drive traffic. And it was a horrible story about a man who was arrested for raping a puppy. Like, it's terrible, that's terrible. And it's like nonsense that we would, like in retrospect, it's absolute nonsense. This was not a local story. Even if it was a local story, why would we do that? But we knew it would, she knew it would drive traffic and it did. We had huge numbers on the story. But if you went and you look at the metrics, we also lost more followers on Facebook than we had in the history of the Facebook page, right? So part of those metrics are not just how many clicks you get, but how are your audiences responding to that story? And letting your audiences both guide you, but also making the right journalistic decisions. And again, this is not something that would most likely happen in any newsroom that I'm in now. But this was early in digital trying to figure out how we're using Facebook to supplement the work that we were doing. And I think it's taking those lessons and looking at all of the metrics within the context of what the story is. Um, the whole, I talk to my students often, just because you can doesn't mean you should and applying that to all of the editorial decisions that you're making even just because you know it will drive traffic what's your responsibility journalistically and drawing all of that in to help make informed decisions but then also listening to your audiences about what they want to hear but also training your audiences of what is considered good journalism going back to Jeremy's you know those metrics can go back to Jeremy's question about media literacy media effects can be really strong. And we, as media practitioners, need to understand what the impact of our work can be in terms of helping all of our many audiences become more media literate. It has to be a two-way street in terms of engagement and metrics and how we both respond and create content to feed that. First, community, reporting on communities. I think it's really about framing and knowing who your audience is. So. KUER is a statewide service, um, so we broadcast with a translator system, a transmitter system, both translators and transmitters. If you want to know the difference, come talk to me after. Um, across the state. So, you know, the bulk of our audience is right here on the Wasatch Front. Um, so it is super easy to talk about what's happening in Salt Lake City. Um, but that does have sort of statewide impact, right? Say homeless issues, right? The majority of people facing homelessness are in Salt Lake County, right? So even though it's right here, we're telling stories that do have an impact on people across the, straight, 
across the state. And a lot of times I think, to go back to my first word, it is about framing. So we had a story last week. America, so I have a reporter who's based in Lehigh, a central Utah reporter, covering growth, poverty, and wealth is the uh, esteemed name we came up with for the beat. Um, and American Fork has a new fire station, or is getting a new fire station. Well, groovy for American Fork. What does that mean for you if you live in, I don't know, Corinne, I don't know, Brigham City? What does that mean for you? So it became about framing and asking different questions. It wasn't the event of the fire station and how much that was going to cost. The question became, what happens when a city grows and when does a, when does a community need a new fire station? Is it about response time? Is it about the number of people in the community? Is it about the footprint of the community? Because we told this station story about American Fork, but you could easily say, oh man, my community's growing really quickly. How does this apply to where I live? So I think you can tell individual stories, but frame them so they have meaning for a broader audience. Um, also, I just like to... Um, Maybe I'm living under a naive illusion, but I have a lot of faith in my audience that they are curious about their neighbors. I think that is a hallmark of a public radio listener. So, you know, sometimes we just tell a story from Lehigh because it's a good story. Or we tell a story from Helper or Price because it's a fascinating person. And I think that's worthwhile too. Um, and that's me putting faith in the in our listeners, in our audience, that they do have that kind of curio curiosity about the world around them. Um, to the metrics question, as I was, uh, I, I love what you had to say about different kinds of metrics, right? It's not just the click. There's so many different metrics that we can be judging from. Um, how long do they stay? Did they click there and go straight away because it was disgusting to them? Or did they purely stay and read every detail of this horrifying story? Um, there's so many ways to parse that. But I also just wanted to put in context, it's not like looking at the audience numbers is something new. It's just something so much more immediate, right? Like you, you pr publish a story in the morning, you know that afternoon how it's doing. But we've always looked at subscriptions and listener numbers, whether it's Nielsen ratings or whatever it may be, viewer ratings. I mean, we know, if a we know if a show on public radio is doing really bad and nobody's tuning in and nobody's calling to donate while that show is on the air. I mean, you do have to listen to your audience in some ways if at the core of all of those decisions is also your mission right and if you're just publishing just for clicks if you are publishing something because it falls in your mission and it does well great if you're doing something in your mission but it's not doing well then you have to ask the question okay, why is it not doing well? And that's the conversation you're having with your reporters. Like, here's what's doing well. Here's what's not doing as well. Why is that? Not just, you're not getting clicks, so you're out of here. Like, the editorial team has to be helping the reporters find that sense of what the community needs and filling those needs. Just one thing to add, the difference between metrics in a pre-digital era versus now is that the, the metrics now can tell us much more detailed information about our audiences, specific, like very specific times, area codes, interests, so many demographics. And so it really blends both of your questions together. We can, if we use this information thoughtfully, we can start identifying content that helps build community based on the data that we're pulling because it can be so specific. I think a lot of newsrooms are exploring that, but we're still, and I can't speak for it, but I think that a lot of newsrooms are still figuring out exactly how to do that best. But every newsroom I know that cares about this is looking at how they can use that data to drive decisions that fit their audience, their mission, and serve their communities as, as well as they possibly.